Many thanks for uh, attending this evening's inaugural lecture in honour of Professor Matthias Schwanauer, Head of Clinical Psychology in the School of Health in Social Science in the College of Humanities and Social Science at the University of Edinburgh. I'm Christopher Bruard. I'm Principal of Edinburgh College of Art, also a school in the College of Humanities and Social Science, and Vice Principal in the University for the Creative and performing arts, and it's my pleasure to chair this evening's event. One of the great joys of working in such a diverse college as the one that we inhabit is that one gets the occasional opportunity of listening to and engaging with very respected scholars in a wide range of disciplines, and tonight is no exception as we celebrate Professor Schwanauer's award of a personal chair in clinical psychology. To give you a little background uh, on Matthias, he was very modest and has told me to keep this short and sharp. Uh, but Matthias, for those of you who don't know, was born in Stuttgart in Germany. He holds a first degree in psychology and in philosophy from the University of Marburg, a DSyc in applied and clinical psychology and an MA in philosophy from the University of Marburg and a PhD in clinical psychology from this university. And additionally, he spent some time at the Free University in Berlin and at UCLA as part of his academic and clinical training. He came to Edinburgh professionally in Janu January 2000, first as a clinical research fellow, uh, and there was, there was then appointed to lecturer in October 2001. He became a senior lecturer in August 2006 and head of clinical psychology in December 2009. So a distinguished record here. He's held clinical appointments as chartered clinical psychologist in NHS Greater Glasgow and NHS Lothian from April 2000 and became a consultant clinical psychologist in child and adolescent mental health in 2004 and was appointed to this chair, clinical psychology, uh, last August 2012 takes us some time to come round to our inaugurals. I haven't done mine yet, so um, there we go. His, cur his current research interests include the application of attachment theory and psychological processes of affect regulation to further our understanding of the development, adaptation to, and recovery from psychosis and recurrent mood disorders. He's particularly interested in the psychology of the onset of and recovery from severe mental health problems in young adults and the advancement of specific psychological interventions. And he says his career highlights to date include the running of randomised clinical treatment trials of psychological interventions and large population studies, as well as, in, as his involvement in the development of clinical practice guidelines. Now this evening, Matthias will speak to the title, From Cradle to Grave, The Development of Relationships, Emotions and Mental Health. Uh, and I should note that Matthias will be happy to receive questions at the end of his presentation, so keep some in mind. Thank you very much, Matthias. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, for the introduction and thanks a lot for coming along. Um, it, um, it, it feels very different to prepare for for this talk from from any other talks um, that I'm used to giving. You know, sometimes it feels like at conferences the talks are really just there to fill the time between the social engagements, and everybody takes a turn. Um, so it feels a bit less. Um, yeah, it, it feels a bit a bit less salient um, than this. Um, very glad you're all here, and you know, as Charlotte said at hers. It feels like a bit of an indulgence to. Um, take your time and take the opportunity to just um, talk about some of the work that I've been involved in with, with lots of colleagues and collaborators um, over the last 10 to 15 years, really. Um, I made myself two promises in preparing for this talk. One was not to overload it with data and put lots of figures and um, data charts on there, and the other was to keep it really slim and narrative, and I think I failed in both of these. So I need, I need you to, to indulge me. and. Um, I try and stick to the story rather than get into the detail. If any of the details strike you, I'm very happy um, to, take, to take questions. Um, 
The Bobby quote at the start from Cradle to Crave is also a slight cheat because I'm really mainly interested in, in, in attachment in the context of young adulthood and adolescence and I, I don't go much beyond that. Um, so those of you who expected a, a lifelong perspective going beyond um, into, into middle age and old age may be disappointed. Um, I'm not, not going to think about that at all. Um, one of the things that, that always interests me particularly in the context of, of the mental health system that we work, our diagnostic and classification system, but also current models of psychological therapy is the role of affect in severe mental health, um, as it's often considered as, a, as an add-on rather than an um, essential component, and certainly a lot of treatment strategies aren't necessarily focused on it. And I really hold those guys responsible for, for this development. Um, this is Kraepelin, who at the end of the 19th century um, started to classify severe mental health problems within the asylums that he hung out. Um, and he did that basically by trying to define the patterns of the cause of disorders that he came across. And he ended up with two main classifications, manic depression, under which he really captured all, all kind of recurrent mood disorders, and dementia precox, which um, was very much seen as a, as a loss and disruption of emotional and cognitive features, which later became schizophrenia, but it was mainly characterized by its deteriorating cause and was seen as a biological deteriorating illness. But importantly, he only, in, in, in his whole populations that he observed, he only ascribed that latter label to the worst 5% of the clinical population. All others were basically described as an affect-based um, affect disorder or illness kind of thing. To quote, we thus come to the conclusion that in dementia precox, partial damage to or destruction of cells of the cerebral cortex must probably occur, which may be compensated for in some cases, but which mostly brings in its wake a singular permanent impairment of the inner life. And it's probably fair to say that that kind of premise still stands with a lot of current mental health research um, as it happens. The other guy I want to, to mention is um, Bleuler, who at the very beginning of the 20th century took a very different approach. Um, maybe it had to do that he mainly hung out in asylums in Switzerland, where maybe the quality of life was higher. But he found that looking at um, Kreplin's group of the schizophrenias, as he called it, that very much recovery was possible and that the majority of the population did not decline in a kind of steady, deteriorating way, um, but actually could, could recover. He placed his main emphasis in terms of classification on affectivities. For, for him, it was affect that determined distress and the cause um, of the illness, and that loosening of association, loss of reality, um, and what he called autism or social withdrawal was very much associated um, with an emotional disturbance, which was seen as primary kind of thing. So he brought affect back into the fold. And to quote, the fundamental symptoms consist of disturbances of association and affectivity, the pre predilections of fantasy as against reality, and the inclination of divorce oneself from reality or autism. He also stressed that the interaction with the environment is crucial, and that through active support and intervention, as well as psychological insight, the cause of these severe disorders can be reversed. And as, it, as so many things in the mid 20th century, it was then Schneider turned it all in his head and defined a different phenomenology of, of mental distress and said we shouldn't go with patterns, we shouldn't go with predictions and cause, we shouldn't go with predictors um, of what is happening, we should simply classify what we can observe. So he introduced a very observable phenomenology of severe mental health and that what we should define as being essential for the disorder is the observable signs and symptoms, which is still very much reflected in our current diagnostic and statistical manual, which will have a, a new edition very soon and I won't talk about that. Um, so there we go. And I think that, that it's that conundrum of the role and, and weight of affectivity within severe and enduring mental health, its onset and its maintenance, that captured my interest somehow. One of the, the aspects within that is to look at attachment and interpersonal development in the context of severe mental distress. Um, I like the context of attachment theory because it's not a theory of psychopathology, but a theory of normal 
um, development and adaptation, and it defines many aspects of our psychological functioning and exploration rather well. So to give you an example of its origins, this is Lorenz with his geese, and he demonstrates the principles of imprinting. Um, their goals to call out to his children, so to speak. And there they come. Very different from most human environments. Um, when you see um, parents calling out to their little ones, um, it's rarely the reaction. Um, and he achieved this by making himself the primary attachment figure of the little geese um, when they were born, who then imprinted um, Africa and survival onto him and follow him around um, on land and in water. <laughs> and you know, he very much primed this as a, as a mechanism of survival and evolutionary um, advantage kind of thing. Things look rather different when we look at human development in terms of attachment. And just to demonstrate principles of imprinting, um, I couldn't resist. Um, this is a young child and engaged in exploratory play um, and discovery of the world. The attachment figures are more distant. Um, and this is how imprinting might work in the human world. Um, it's actually the child that determines the behavioral reaction of the parent rather than the other way around. And exploration is possible by the child perceiving the parent behind her and relying um, that they follow. And I think um, there's very much a sense of reciprocity and interaction within the attachment system in, in, in human development. And that it's the interaction between child and caregiver rather than a kind of conditioning of one on the other that determines, it's quite dramatic now, um, that, that um, determines its functions of affect regulation, exploration and play, and psychological survival. So obviously the um, core figures of um, Bowlby and Ainsworth, um, so the ability to use an attachment figure as a secure base affords a haven of safety and provides the confidence necessary to explore and master ordinary um, development. So it's a principle of, of human growth and development. And exploration has a key importance to human adaptation. Flexibility and problem solving are advantageous, particularly in the context of stress and, and de-stress. So through a history of responsive care, infants will evolve expectations of their caregivers, likely responses to signs of distress and other signals of the desire for, for contact. And it's again that reciprocity and communication present in the attachment system that enables human development. That internalized and increasingly internalized model governs how children feel towards each caregiver and about themselves and how they expect to be treated um, by the world as they plan their own behavior and toward their caregivers. So it sort of facilitates autonomy um, in the development. One of the key aspects, particularly looking at, at um, mental health and mental distress and emotional distress, are the processes of mentalization that are associated with it. Um, that through the attachment system and through the reciprocity between caregiver and, and infant, the young infant implicitly or explicitly interprets his or her action in, and those of others as meaningful on the basis of intentional mental states. So we start to perceive the other in, in terms of, of mental states, their intentions, desires, motivations, and so forth, not just in terms of their behavior. And that that capacity to mentalize others and ourselves evolves through social interaction and, and caregiving um, within that. And in the context of complex mental health problems or the emergence of complex mental health problems, the reduction of mentalization in the face of stress, so when, when that attachment system goes into a, into a threat mode, leads to a loss of an awareness and ability to differentiate internal and external experiences and regulate negative and unwanted affects, um, also leading to, to interpersonal instability. So we feel that mentalization and reflective function are uniquely human capacities required for complex social interactions. And to make sense of the actions of oneself and others, um, we do that on the basis of intentional mental states, such as desires, feelings, and beliefs.
Um, and that makes the world predictable and allows us to, to explore and go on. And with Bowlby, change continues throughout the life cycle so that changes for better or for worse are always possible. It is this continuity, continuing potential for change that means that at no time of life is a person invulnerable to every possible adversity and also at no time of life is a person impermeable to favorable influence. It is this persisting potential for change that gives opportunity for effective therapy. So what, what attracts us is very much the plasticity and reciprocity of the attachment system to explain affect regulation, affect dysregulation and um, to deal with challenging interpersonal env environments both historically and current. So development within attachment theory is seen as a, as a process of directed change and adaptation. And psychopathology in its manifestations is seen as an adaptation to particular circumstances, both historical and current. And that implies that there are good reasons why somebody might develop signs and symptoms of distress, and there are good reasons why the beha behavioral reactions in the context of distress emerge in certain ways. It means we can understand mental anguish and distress, we can explain it, and we therefore can find a context of, of alleviating it. And that is particularly um, true in the, in the case of stressful life events and trauma, um, where individuals develop so-called secondary attachment behaviors, related to over under regulation of affect, which is very much what we observe within context of emotional distress. And I'll get to that. And what it does often, trauma and loss in particular, in terms of significant life events, it, it leaves unresolved mental states in terms of attachment. Um, the individual becomes less, less integrated and less able to cope um, with these contexts, which then manifests in irrational thought process, unfounded fear and guilt, and provides us with a context to reformulate manifestations of emotional distress. Okay, then my adolescence, <laughs> and it's an interesting question. We, I came to, to adolescent development very much as a time when both individuality and autonomy develops, where individuals become more autonomous of their caregivers and explore the world in different ways, where the internal representation of the world and others becomes more abstract and more independent, but curiously also where most severe mental health problems emerge and occur. And we all know or remember that adolescence is also a period of normative emotional distress and um, behavioral reactions to that distress. And it's that differentiation of what is a, a normal developmental adaptive process to a very turbulent developmental phase and what is the emergence of distress that's more lasting and enduring kind of thing. And there are different layers to this. You know, we, we have current theories of adolescent development that very much attribute this to the rapid brain development in adolescence and that, that things simply don't, don't settle um, you know, for a while, um, but also challenging interpersonal um, and developmental stages in terms of becoming more independent, relating to the world and others in different ways, and care caregivers becoming less important in their, in their physicality and presence and more important in terms of how they're internally represented. Key characteristics of adolescent mental, mental health, just a few, are elevated, expansive or irritable mood, inflated self-esteem or grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, more talkativeness or pressured speech, racing thought, increased activity, and excessive involvement in risky activities. Very much a list of adolescent behaviors, observable and felt, but also the diagnostic criteria for mania in the context of bipolar disorder. Um, and you know, I think some of this might be to blame with the, the kind of skyrocketing of bipolar disorder rates in the, in the States, that where you know, there's less and less tolerance for normal um, behavioral variation. But then also on the side of um, psychosis and psychotic experiences, having difficulty thinking clearly or other people finding your speech does not make sense or is difficult to follow. Again, I can think of many adolescents um, where that would um, apply, becoming withdrawn from friends and family, losing interest and having poor self-care, lacking motivation, experiencing change in your emotions such as feeling more anxious, depressed or overly excitable, more irritable. Um, hearing voices talking to you or about you, 
or other experiences that people cannot witness and becoming suspicious of people or situations around one, holding beliefs that other people don't agree with or having unusual experiences like getting special messages from CDs, TV or the papers kind of thing. So again, sort of quite an overlapping spectrum in terms of adolescent adaptation in a, in a kind of normal developmental framework and the emergence of severe mental health. And I think we, we can at times lose sight of that. And what, what becomes important then to go back um, to, to the old guys I flagged up at the start is the level of affectivity and affective distress that makes a real qualitative difference in terms of what we might classify as mental anguish and what we might classify as normal adolescent development. When we think about the onset of severe mental health problems in adolescent, though, we also know that that has a major impact on the developmental trajectory of the young person. Often future planning, developmental achievements and goals are undermined by the onset of it. So also if we normalize too much in the context of adolescent experience, we may also miss very negative developmental trajectories that we need to bear in mind. In this next part, um, I'm going to walk through a series of studies that we carried out over, over a number of years. Um, that try and establish the role of interpersonal and developmental factors within the, the context of severe mental health in adolescents and, and young adults. Um, they're all reported incompletely, um, so I'm just taking the kind of main snapshots kind of thing. Again, if you have questions, just let me know. I'm very happily talk, talk about more, more data. Um, so two very early, early studies. Um, the, the first one, which really owed a great that to, to Lorna Champion, who, who influenced the development of this, which was a very classic study of looking at psychosocial factors within mental health, um, to look at the impact of life events, trauma, social support, and family environments, so the classic psychosocial context of mental health, which was very much separated from the phenomeno phenomenology of, of mental health. It was a study of individuals with recurrent depression and schizophrenia, and looking at social support, negative family environments, and life events showing a clear effect of both support and environment on the levels of distress and chronicity in this group, but most pronounced in the face of adverse life events and the interaction of low support and high levels of interpersonal stress. And that really led to the thought that it's the process of interpersonal interactions that are important here rather than the structure. So it's not the size of the network, it's not the quality of the support, it's not the level of social strain, it's the interactions of those and the effect it has on people's well-being and, and emotional health. The next one, um, which was initiated by, by Rob Raid, um, Karen Blair, and um, Emily, who's here, was very involved in this, um, is looking at, um, again, psychosocial factors and interpersonal factors in mental ill health in a, in a population of young people at, at very high risk, so at risk of homelessness, people sleeping rough, people living in shelters, people having had multiple moves kind of thing. And um, within this group, multiple problems, so drug and alcohol use, um, interpersonal stresses, and so forth. Um, we looked at a, at a group of young people who were somehow in touch with voluntary agencies um, and looked at quality of life, depression, and self-harming, self-esteem, and life events. Again, quite a sort of structural hypothesis to look how these interact. We also looked at cognitive factors in terms of negative attributions, and interpersonal factors in terms of perceived support. So again, kind of building a, a broader model of the psychology of distress within that group. We found incredibly high levels of distress with you know, over two thirds showing signs of um, clinical depression, 20% anxiety, 6% post-traumatic stress disorder, and 27% um, showing symptoms of psychosis. Um, two thirds were known to services, so have at some point presented to either primary or, or, or secondary um, mental health services, but they're not currently in services and receiving support and help. Um, so that clearly kind of triggered us to think about psychological factors that are linked to help seeking and service engagement. Um, now, because um, we're looking at complex interactions of these, of these factors, um, and we, we, we aim to use methodologies that can do that justice. I want to do a slight excursion and introduce some of the methods we're using. Um, this is a kind of um, 
bubble picture of a, of a linear regression where we basically have whatever we want to explain on, on one side, let's say depression, and a number of predictors that predict or explain a level of variance within that depression. And they're usually chained up and they're assumed to be, to be linear. What we're more interested in is sort of the interaction of these variables. So this, in this process, we look at so-called mediation, where there's basically a second or third variable that interacts with both the predictor and um, the outcome variable, say depression, and paints a more complex picture of, of how that might interact. And because we don't want to stop there, we can also look at so-called double mediations or multiple mediations of, of several factors having a bearing both on the interaction itself and on the outcome variable. And we can also include moderators, so some variables that directly impact on the outcome variable or indeed on one of the predictors kind of thing. So we can, we can aim to paint a more complex picture um, that best explains what we find rather than simply chaining them up kind of thing. That's really as technical as I, as I want to get. And when we apply this, it looks like this, um, that this is an example where we look at, at self-harming in young people at, at risk of homelessness. We find that um, dysfunctional attitudes and personal beliefs, so kind of negative cognitive assumptions and attributions, have very much a direct bearing on, on self-harming behavior as a, as a sign of distress in that group but also that the quality of, of social support in relationships um, and negative life events sort of moderate that relationship. So we, we start to get an idea about the interaction of these factors um, within that context. So that then kicked off sort of a series of, of studies to look more at the interaction of psychosocial factors of mental ill health rather than just looking at what is associated with it um, on one hand. Um, so within that, we found an interaction between different psychological variables and that interpersonal aspects of cognitive factors um, moderate the impact of negative cognitive styles. So there's something about the quality of the relationships that has an interaction and an effect on how much bearing these negative cognitions, negative assumptions can have on mental ill health. Um, and these predictors of distress are also well related to help seeking and engagement with support and services. So not so much the level of distress, but also how support is sought and utilized. And that's somehow, this is the classical model of cognitive behavioral therapy where we have thoughts or cognitions interacting with physical signs of distress, behaviors that either trigger or result from it, and feelings in terms of you know, anxiety or, or depression. And what we're basically introducing is that there's an interpersonal component to both cognitions and emotions that determine the impact and the interaction with the level of distress that we're interested in. We then looked at, more specifically, coming back to those core themes, attachment, mentalization, and recovery within psychosis. And looking at secondary attachment strategies within that. Um, so on the basis of an insecure, unresolved attachment style, secondary attachment strategies are related to over and under regulation. So deactivating strategies where the individual is trying not to seek proximity, denying attachment needs and avoiding closeness, which is linked to a particular recovery style within psychosis. People who don't engage very well with services or treatment offered within them and find it difficult to seek help and to make best use of it. And hyperactivating strategies, so very energetic attempts to achieve proximity, support and love, combined with a lack of confidence once that is offered. So these are often people are equally difficult to engage, to usually stick to services, but don't find a very constructive um, context for that. So we looked at that within a mixed method study, which means we had sort of qualitative interviews and also collected some data, and conducted a grounded theory analysis of individual recovery narratives um, within a first psychotic episode, and used reflective function based on the adult attachment interview to see whether that gives us a clue in how the recovery narratives unfold. And what we found is that there's a clear and keen difference between those who have a higher capacity to mentalize, thinking back, so have a higher capacity to understand their own and other um, people's intentional, motivational, and emotional states and can relate to their own emotionality and that of others, and those who have negative or limited reflective function in that sense. 
So in terms of recovery to the life experience of psychosis, those with moderate or high reflective function had a higher level of acceptance of what was happening to them. Um, they were mourning the loss of peers more in an empathic way. Um, they had more of an acceptance and mindful self-compassion towards their own distress. They found it easier to, to talk about their distress with others and um, they managed how they came across better kind of thing. And that also was reflected in the narratives about the adolescent development, that they had a more confident self-expression, they were more confident young people. Um, they integrated themselves more with their, with their peer group um, and they had a more realistic reorientation, you know, once psychosis hit of what that means for their life. Whereas those with negative or limited reflective function had a higher level of avoidance and denial, a loss of peers, but you know, with a sense of indifference, like I don't need them and so forth. Um, more negative disillusionment with, with, with life and their goals, a lower self-efficacy, more passive coping, they were more passively accepting what was offered to them. But also within the adolescent developmental, within their developmental trajectories in adolescence, sort of less um, integration with peers and a higher level of idealization of peers who were not mentally unwell, um, greater level of isolation, a higher level of parental cri criticism and conflict with parents, um, and, and a failure to being able to, to plan and look, look forward kind of thing. So it seems that this sort of psychological process linked to attachment in terms of mentalization gives us a clue how somebody adapts to a kind of stressful and traumatic life event such as the first psychotic episode. So in terms of um, adaptation to psychosis, impaired reflective function was associated with avoidance, denial, and confusion. Um, mentioned both of those. And in terms of the adolescent development, impaired reflective function was related to difficulties in expressing self-identity. So a much <coughs> harder road to recovery and adaptation to the life event. Um, so individuals with lower reflective function and poorer affect regulation, weaker self-organization, perceive psychosis and its possible consequences as a greater threat to themselves and their lives. In a different study, we had a look at the, the um, impact and interaction of um, trauma, attachment, and psychosis, something that um, Lucy Clark, who sits here, um, carried out for her doctoral thesis. Um, where we again looked at the, the interactions of attachment and how people who already have a psychosis deal with past and current trauma um, as, as one of the key, key factors impacting on the ability to, to adapt and deal with it. Um, in this sample, I had incredibly high um, incidence of, of traumatic life events, both historically and, and concurrently. And Again, thinking about that, that picture, these are simple mediation analyses rather than past analyses, but we basically found that, just to take a snapshot, that particularly emotional distress in view of early interpersonal trauma, but also um, interpersonal trauma generally, was strongly mediated by attachment security or insecurity. So again, how somebody was able to, to function, interact with other in terms of attachments and um, mental states very much determined how much distress was um, expressed and, and observed in the context of historical and concurrent trauma. In another study, uh, we, we um, looked at attachment, mentalization, adaptation within a general child and adolescent mental health service. This is something that Becky Fisher um, did it's part of a PhD, so it's an adult attachment interview-based sample of 73 adolescents who all experienced a major mental health problem within CAMS tier four services, so day services, inpatient services. Looking at attachment, reflective function, emotion regulation, and quality of life following the initial treatment. So these are people who are already engaged in treatment and had some benefit from it. Um, within that, two thirds roughly showed insecure dismissive attachment, 8% insecure preoccupied, and 13% showed unresolved attachment mental states in view of, of loss and trauma. So again, that, that impact, that level of functioning. Now again, it's a bit small and a bit daft, but basically the, the idea is that um, 
attachment-related reflective function has some direct effect on psychological adaptation, but it's very much mediated by so-called secondary attachment um, strategies or strategies of emotion regulation kind of thing. And as clinicians, that's good news because we can intervene at that level, whereas we can't intervene um, in others. And um, that's looking at interpersonal difficulties which moderate um, that relationship. So again, concurrent difficulties moderate the effect that attachment-related difficulties have on mental well-being. This is some snapshot of our Glasgow Edinburgh study um, with Andrew Gumley and, and a host of collaborators um, looking at symptomatic recovery, service engagement and remission over time, so not just taking a snapshot. Um, 79 individuals across both early intervention and, and core mental health services. Um, attachment in that was unrelated to symptom severity or how distressed somebody was. Similar figures, 30% were securely attached, which was an initial surprise, but then um, led to some further, further thinking. About half showed insecure dismissive attachment, 20% insecure preoccupied, and 30% unresolved in view of trauma and loss. So the rough proportions are not dissimilar to what we find within the CAMS population. And again, um, just to, to pick out some, some key aspects of that, where we look at recovery of negative symptoms, so the, the aspect of psychosis that leads to social withdrawal, anhedonia, um, persistent low mood, a lack of engagement with life and with others, we find that attachment does contribute to that relationship, but the duration of untreated psychosis, so the time that somebody spend after the onset of the illness until they receive appropriate treatments, and their own insight in having a, a disorder and accepting that um, also contribute significantly. And where we try to use um, insight as a mediator of, of attachment, so that self-assuredness in terms of negative symptoms, um, we, we find a strong mediating um, relationship. When we look at remission, um, so you know, who has sort of after at follow-up at six months, a very low level um, of um, symptoms and no major um, relapse using those particular criteria, um, we find that attachment is one of the key key predictors of people improving over that or achieving remission over that time. So the predictors that kind of come out in this um, very much cluster around um, sort of known, known predictors of duration of untreated psychosis and psychiatric insight, but also the kind of coherence of narratives, so how somebody relays their attachment experiences seems to predict particularly negative symptoms and, and remissions. And a coherence of the narrative reflects how these attachment-related thoughts, memories, and affects are regulated in context of attachment-related discourse, so people's ability to reflect and think about attachment-related experiences and difficulties. And that's further evidence supporting the importance of a relational context of recovery um, in terms of service engagement and, you know, for example, the use of the Mental Health Act within that. When we particularly looked at service engagement um, as, as one of the, the aspects here, um, again, we find that these um, significantly predict engagement, but again, that there's a more, more complex relationship and interaction between how well somebody engages at 12 months after presentation to services, um, being, being moderated by the duration of untreated psychosis, partially mediated by insight, but also influenced by their attachment narrative. So again, a more complex picture of sort of inter, interpersonal functioning. Um, just to look at, at some of the differences in terms of what poor and, and um, good engagement with services achieves in terms of symptomatic recovery. Um, there isn't much difference in terms of positive symptoms, because I think we're quite good at treating first rung symptoms of schizophrenia and psychosis, but there's a clear difference in terms of emotional recovery and the emergence of negative symptoms in this early group, and I think that's something we need to pay closer attention to. predominantly a dismissive attachment style associated with negative symptoms. And within that, it's important how we understand this arrested recovery and lack of emotional recovery and link it to a loss of affect, as Bloiler described, going back to my um, quote, and how this may be mediated by attachment-based affect regulation processes. Now, in this last part, for which I have 10 minutes, I think, 
Um, I want to look at um, attachment in the context of psychological therapies. So what happens when we directly look at attachment-related processes and interactions in an application of psychological therapy um, with an emphasis on that? And this is particularly important when we look at these secondary attachment strategies, so how somebody relates to negative and unwanted um, feelings and how they're able to, to, to react and cope with these. Um, but also in terms of service engagement, because again, sort of the, the attachment um, history and attachment representation will determine how somebody relates to somebody offering help and how they might seek help. But also in terms of um, reflective function, how they can relate to their own mental states, their distress, recovery, and, and engagement. And again, thinking back about the adolescent context, we always have this challenge to differentiate between um, nuts and eccentric. So what is part of a normal adaptive developmental process and what is a true expression of um, psychological psychiatric um, distress. So we looked at um, using cognitive interpersonal therapy which kind of combines the kind of cognitive elements that work with the interpersonal elements that work um, in, in a very simple open um, trial. Um, we get a clear treatment effect on positive symptoms so the stuff works in terms of psychosis, um, but it's partially because it's in the context of services that we know work quite well in the context of psychosis, um, where we compare. And um, it also has a clear positive effect on, on depression. When we look at predictors of outcome at six months within the small trial, we again find that reflective function based on the AI and interpersonal difficulties are the key predictors for those who do well and do less well. So overall the group improves, but what predicts positive outcomes is again the ability to relate to, to emotional and, and intentional motivational content in self and others, and the level of interpersonal difficulties and interpersonal strain that somebody has in their, in their life. Um, so metacognition and reflective function are key factors in the association between interpersonal trauma and distress in different populations across the piece, and I gave you a few snapshots. In that higher metacognition reflective function is associated with early trauma and increased anxiety and worry within these groups. And changes in reflective function and metacognitive capacity, so targeted treatment strategies, is associated with positive outcomes in both psychotic symptoms and levels of emotional distress. Another example, which looks specifically at bipolar disorder, again, similar rates of 20% you know, securely attached, 36% um, um, sorry, 40% insecure, dismissively attached, and 30% having unresolved loss and trauma within this bipolar group. Um, clear effect of de on depression of the, the treatment, but no effect on, on mania. And I think there's a whole chapter and story about the treatment of mania and hypomania that I'm, I'm not going to go into. Um, but also clear effect on perceived quality of life within that group. So independent of, of symptom severity, how well somebody feels integrated um, interpersonally and how they um, estimate their, their physical and psychological health. And there's a clear difference um, where treatment is administered. And again, it's the same predictors, partially because we use the same design, but it's the same predictors of reflective function and interpersonal difficulties that have a direct bearing on these, on these outcomes. So within that group, it's particularly the association with depression that seems important as driving emotional distress. And that sometimes is contrary to, to the kind of treatment strategies we have for bipolar disorder, which very much focus on the occurrence of mania and hypomania. Um, so this is just another sort of snapshot, really. Um, to This is an, an older treatment trial where we're very much interested in the interaction of cognitive and interpersonal factors on treatment outcomes. But we're also interested in changes in these predictors over the course of treatment. So not just do a higher level of negative attitudes determine how well somebody does in therapy, but is it actually the change in these attitudes that predicts positive outcome? And the same with the interpersonal factors. So we know somebody has a lower perceived level of support and higher interpersonal strain doesn't tend to do so well. But on the other hand, is it also changes in these factors in how they perceive their interpersonal life that has a bearing on the, on the outcome? Um, and again, um, just to give you, give you a snap, oops, dear, sorry. Um, when we look at depression, we, we get very much a kind of 
double mediation so that there is a clear impact on changes in cognitive factors on depression as we would expect using cognitive behavioral therapy techniques. But that effect is also mediated by changes in interpersonal factors. So again, it's the quality and impact of the interpersonal environment that has a kind of additional impact on the improvement of both the cognitive factors. So they're very much linked and they very much interact. And when we look at mania, this doesn't work so well um, in that all of these variables have a direct effect and a few indirect effects. So there's some predictive power of baseline symptoms, but a clear mediating effect of cognitive factors, dysfunctional attitudes, loss, and so forth, which are in turn mediated by interpersonal factors. So in many ways, attachment and its psychological consequences in individual development provide us with a conceptual background in understanding adaptation to adversity, negative affect, and resulting mental health and well-being. So it gives us a key for intervention and understanding of these interactions. And a developmental and interpersonal perspective clearly adds a new dimension to models of psychological therapy that may increase its effectiveness and difficult to reach um, and presentations with prognosis of partially unsuccessful treatments. So those who don't engage well with services and those who tend to do um, quite poorly, we believe that that adds a dimension of, of intervention. It allows an understanding of emotional distress and um, disorder formation when we look at recovery and adaptation to, to negative life events. It also helps us to understand the good reasons why somebody may develop certain symptoms and manifestations of distress at that point in time, given their particular context and background. And most crucially, it offers us a new perspective on recovery and adaptation, defining alternative outcome strategies rather than focusing on on symptoms, so very much thinking with Bloiler rather than Schneider. Oops, that's, that's not very good, sorry. Um, <coughs> so, um, to kind of contradict the, the old man slightly, uh, that cognitions and cognitive processes, both developmentally and functionally, grow and affect mental health within an interpersonal context. I don't believe we can think about the impact of cognitions without considering the interpersonal context, both in their development and their effect um, at the time. I'm not sure you would agree. Um, okay, that's really as much as I wanted to say um, today. Um, before I close, I, I very much want to want to thank people who have been influential and 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 important. Um, my parents and my sister, who very much taught me how not to do adolescence. Um, mentors and collaborators both in, in Scotland and, and of old and dear colleagues and friends who kind of foster this work, but also very much the, the kind of clinical services both in, in Glasgow and um, Lodin, which very much taught me about um, the context of adolescent um, mental health. And of course, my own family who give lots of inspiration, um, creativity and, and energy um, to make make all this possible and, and happen and have some balance. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Matthias, for such an impressive and um, insightful lecture. Uh, it was delivered with great clarity. Uh, it was beautifully presented with images, diagrams, and films, important for someone like me, an artist who um, is outside of your discipline. Uh, and it demonstrated, clearly demonstrated, important, impactful research. So um, we're gr very grateful to you for that. I think it was the um, model of an inaugural, and you'll always remember it because it was delivered during those torrential downpours <laughs> at, the of the, at the beginning of the lecture. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.